we're here right now with our special guest, Ashley Langliers, and she is the clinical manager of the Fresno office for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. We always encourage you guys to go to uh, www.centerforautism.com, click the locations tab, see if there is a card office near you, uh, because they're a great resource, and it may be that the card office is 10 minutes away from you because they're all over the world, or it might be that they're an hour or two hours away, they're still going to be a resource for you. I think it's good to know where the nearest card office is. Um, but in any case, we've been talking about working with children on the autism spectrum, doing ABA when they're older. And we just talked about if we're starting ABA for the first time when the kids are older. And now I kind of want to switch gears and talk a little bit about, for those of you who are out there that did a little bit of ABA, and I, it's a heartbreaking tale for me, those of you who went through the stress and the funding to, to get ABA, but somebody gave the prescription for eight hours a week or six hours a week. And what I hear from you guys a lot, I'll, I, when I'm talking to a parent, I say, so did you do ABA? And they'll say, yeah, we did ABA. We really didn't get uh, much of an improvement and it was too hard in the family. So, and it was too much money. So we stopped doing ABA and now I'm hearing all these things and, and I, that, you know, people getting all this success, I don't really understand. And I always say, well, how much ABA? did you do? And I'll hear things like eight hours a week for six months or a year or something like that. And and of course, I think I'm heartbroken. And I think, well, you know, that's like giving the, the prescription for the antibiotic for strep throat, but only giving two of the pills when you needed 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not the prescription. And yet those poor parents, because somebody told them it was. Um, it's really, uh, that's when I get frustrated. Um, but you know, you're here now, you're here today. And we always talk about it's important to process what happened before, but to figure out what to do today. And the truth of the matter is your child might be 15 now and you're having some difficulties in thinking about doing ABA. Ashley, talk to us about, because I'm sure you see this in your practice, that you know the kids who had it one round and come back. Is it any different than the kids starting over? I mean, at at um, at the beginning or at intake, the considerations are always the same in terms about in terms of you know finding where the deficit is and finding you know how we need to program to overcome that deficit or right. just help the child succeed. Um, I think there's probably more potential if a child has had ABA before that some of the more severe problem behaviors are maybe um, eliminated, but maybe okay. those those less severe problem behaviors might still be around, okay. um, which I think will lead some people to think, um, you know, oh, well, the aggression is gone, so we're done, or, yeah. you know, or they're no longer engaging in property destruction, so we're done, yeah. um, which is great, but, you know, there's a lot of times, and most of the times, if, if it was like one of the cases that you you kind of described, someone mm-hmm. who got ABA for eight hours a week for six months, you know, right. there's most definitely probably going to be some areas that the child still needs still needs to work on. Um, and I think one of the most common things I hear from parents who, who come back, maybe if they had ABA when mm-hmm. their child was younger, is they're kind of thinking, well, you know, he, he's 15 now. Like, what are you going to do? Right. Um, yeah, because, you did this little lesson before where you were, you know, doing this matching. He's 15 now. What are you going to do? Exactly. Even all the, like, the videos that you see, the little ABA clips there of. Mm-hmm you know, adult sitting with a child in like these little chairs right. <laughs> um, with edible reinforcement right. and thinking like that's just not going to be appropriate anymore. And they're right. Obviously that wouldn't be appropriate anymore. And um, we've actually had somebody asking for, and we're going through the library finding videos because they want to see videos of therapists working with older kids that they, you know, to model from. So we've had people asking for that. So I'm, I'm loving that you're talking about this. So oh, what, that'd be great. I would, I'd love to see more of those videos even, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> um, and we do have some, so oh, we're, we're awesome going through them. But what kinds of things are we are we going to see when we see that? <laughs> uh, I think a lot more um, instruction that just re- resembles the natural environment. So okay. um, ABA is a very broad term and it mm-hmm. consists of a lot of people think, when they think of ABA, they're actually thinking of one type of instruction a lot of times I find mm-hmm. and they're thinking of DTT or discrete mm-hmm. trial teaching, which is that very, very structured type of teaching right. um, that you see a lot with younger kids. Mm-hmm. Um, if you try to do that you know, with a 15-year-old, they're most likely just not 
going to have it. Right. <laughs> and they'll be very bored and it just wouldn't be appropriate. That, that leads to rote memorization and yeah. just things that aren't that aren't that helpful. Um, so what's more effective usually or more appropriate is something called NET or NET, Natural Environment right. Teaching, which is where ABA therapists are contriving situations throughout the day, throughout the therapy session in real kind of world settings. Um, so we have some, you know, therapists who part of their lessons each day in includes like walking to the gas station and buying a soda and then mm -hmm. they walk back and during that time obviously they're working on like money, social greetings mm -hmm. with, um, you know, community workers, mm -hmm. um, conversation skills, all of those types of things. Um, and I, th I think that's the biggest, just probably one of the biggest considerations that we have to take into account when working with older kids is just remembering their age and mm -hmm. remembering that you always have to take into account what is socially appropriate for them, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, I think it's so important to observe their typically developing peers a lot in terms of figuring yeah. out what, you know, what are kids their age doing? If yeah. you don't, if you don't not, if you don't have access to maybe typically developing peers a lot, which I think a lot of times we don't, um, just because we spend all day, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, I think it's important, especially for those kids to be figuring out, yeah. um, you know, what are their peers doing and mimicking like those types of things and teaching them those types of activities. Yeah, and it changes. I was just saying before that, you know, we got some things that we have to, my son is on the spectrum, and, and we have some things that we have to work on at home, because I, I just didn't realize that it's moved into a new age range with the boys and how boys interact, and I got to get a little bit more up to speed on oh, yeah. just different animals. And I and I was overhearing a conversation uh, last week with somebody talking about working with somebody who was 20 on the spectrum, and that part of what they do is text each other, Yeah. Um, that that's part of the thing and you know learning appropriate social rules in terms of texting and uh, maintaining friendships and not over texting mm -hmm. but responding appropriately when somebody does text you it's a whole whole new world <laughs> oh, definitely. and it's overwhelming to us and I don't know what all the social rules are right. in the world. So imagine being, a, you know, a 16-year-old on the spectrum and looking at it and going, how does anybody make sense of any of this? Right, right. Um, but you guys, that's exactly what you guys do is focus on what's appropriate for them where they are. Exactly. And, I mean, such a big part of even just the card to curriculum or a long-term goal for someone needs to be um, being able to establish, like, lasting friendships. I yes. think we get a lot of kids maybe who might have had ABA to a certain point or never had ABA. And they're, um, they made a lot of gains, but maybe their social language or their conversation skills weren't quite, you know, mm -hmm. um, where they needed to be at termination of treatment. And those are the kids that we see, you know, that end up having to be like homeschooled because they're, they've yeah. been like so severely bullied at school. Ugh. And those types of things can lead to, you know, like other psychiatric problems later on in life, like anxiety and depression and things like that. And that's just, just so horrible, especially now that we have, um, the, the technology basically yeah. to learn how to teach some of these skills yeah, um, that would just so so greatly improve the quality of, of these kids lives. Absolutely. Somebody just wrote in and said I wish there were ABA apps for teens which wouldn't that be fabulous uh, yeah. and we have some people here that are working on uh, apps and things we'll, yeah. we'll definitely let them know that you would like that. I would imagine that there are some things that are out there that lend themselves really well uh, whether they are intentional ABA or not, that there's got to be some sort of social skills kind of apps that are out there. We'll check into that because uh, yeah. that's a pretty good idea. Uh, we keep talking about there are people who have come in here and been on the show before that I keep saying, you got to write a book, you got to write a book because <laughs> there are lists here that they have that they work on with teenagers. I'm sure you have some of these too about, you know, what to do when. Like right. there's a card somewhere of what to do when you run into your ex girlfriend <laughs> uh, with her. Her new boyfriend you know what are the appropriate responses there's literally a card here at card that describes you know here are some appropriate things to say in this given circumstance and they're building them up over time as right. clients write in and say or you know experience and say you know uh and at some point, I'm sure they'll be available in some format, or book, or whatever. I think people Love who it. weren't on the spectrum would buy them. No, probably. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's I, a lot of complex social situations. Yeah, and the whole dating thing. I have single friends that are like, "Oh, somebody explain it to me." <laughs> somebody, and I go, "Oh no, married, <laughs> done with that." I have no idea. But in a in a real sense, though, starting to work with any 
anyone on the spectrum, it all starts in the same place that you're going to need a really good assessment because if you don't, how do you know what to work on? Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. And uh, I don't even know, you guys are dealing with insurance, so insurance must have some sort of provision for doing the assessment. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, I think it's pretty standard across probably providers. It's just um, insurance, you usually in California, we'll get like a pre authorization for okay. um, an assessment, and then the number of hours should be requested by the provider. Uh -huh. Typically, maybe a few more hours are requested for an older child um, just because it tends to be a little bit more um, in depth. Okay, but, um, interesting. All right. Sort of well, that's fascinating because way back in the day, getting the assessment was the first big thing you had to have the money for before you could even. So, if insurance is going to start to cover that, that's a wonderful thing.